Hello everybody, welcome to this video on A.M. Klein. A.M. Klein is a Canadian Jewish poet and he has written a very famous poem called Indian Reservation, Kaunavaga. Kaunavaga is the name of the reservation. What is an Indian Reservation? An Indian Reservation is where the Red Indians are put and uh, they are treated in a very uh, derogatory manner or in a very um, condescending manner by the whites. They are given food and shelter and all that, but their real culture gets destroyed. Their um, real values get corrupted. Reservation life is not a very good thing. Many writers have written against it. So, the non-Americans or the non-whites, they are like charity given uh, food and shelter, but it leads to a lot of problems. So, there is a big debate on whether uh, reservation is entirely good or right. Whether it is uh, actually helping the natives or not, that um, debate is there. So, A.M. Klein has written about Kaunavaga, an Indian reservation. A.M. Klein was born in Volhynia, which is now in the Russian, which was at that time in the Russian Empire, now in Ukraine. He was a Canadian poet, journalist, novelist, short story writer and lawyer, one of Canada's greatest poets. And he was a leading Jewish figure. He was raised in an orthodox environment and he was encouraged to enter the rabbinate. Rabbinate means Jewish priesthood. He attended McGill University, very major university in Canada and studied law at the University of Montreal. Oh, that was very long ago in 1930-33. In the later years, he practiced law in Montreal and edited Jewish Chronicle, Canadian Jewish Chronicle, lectured at McGill. Very active he was. Also, he was there in Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which is now the new Democratic Party. Oh, he had a nervous breakdown in the mid-1950s. He retired from legal practice, ceased or stopped editing and writing, lived in seclusion with his family and friends. A.M. Klein's verse reflects his strong involvement with Jewish culture and history. Now listen to me guys. Jewish culture is one of marginality, marginalization. And this experience of marginalization is what makes A.M. Klein talk about the experience of the natives. The native Canadians are also marginalized. That is what he talks about in this poem. A.M. Klein was a member of the Montreal group of poets. It was a group or coterie of poets who were influenced by T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, modernists and even James Joyce. They broke with the tradition. They broke with the tradition of sentimental nature poetry, which was then popular in Canada. The Montreal group of poets are modernists. They broke with the uh, tradition and they wrote very different kind of poetry. And New Provinces, that was their anthology. Have you heard guys? A.M. Klein was an ardent supporter of Zionism. Zionism means support of Jewish culture. Klein made the Jewish experience a vehicle for his artistic expressions. The Jewish experience became a vehicle for his artistic expressions. Hath Not a Jew, Poems, The Hitleriad, etc. are volumes that deal with Jewish persecution by the Russians and Nazis. You know how in the Holocaust, the Russians, oh sorry, the Nazis killed, exterminated the Jews. After a visit to Israel, he wrote about its creation in the second scroll, which is a symbolic novel that carries overtones of James Joyce. A.M. Klein was an authority on James Joyce. Did you know that? The rocking chair and other poems departs from the Jewish frame of reference and talks about industrialization in Quebec. Quebec is the French part of Canada. Now remember guys, 
Quebec is in the French part of Canada. Montreal, where I am, Klein lived and worked, was in Quebec. And in Conewaga Reservation, the poem, he talks about the French defeating and exterminating the Iroquois tribe. So, A.M. Klein contributed significantly to the emergence of a modern as well as modernist, distinctively Canadian literature. Okay, so, are you ready to read the poem with me? Indian Reservation, Kanavaga. Where are the braves, the faces like autumn fruit, who stared at the child from the colored frontispiece? You know, it is like a, the speaker is talking about his own childhood probably. When the child looked in wonder at the books from the cover page, the brave Indians looked back at the child. They had ripe red faces like autumn fruit. Where are those men now? Those men have all disappeared. Those Indian men have disappeared. Where are the braves, the faces like autumn fruit, who stared at the child from the colored frontispiece? And the monosyllabic chief who spoke with his throat. The Indian chief spoke like this with his throat. Where is that Indian chief now? The child will notice such things. Oh, how red his face is, like autumn fruit. Is he speaking with his throat? It's a child's perspective you see here. This child's perspective will later change into an adult's perspective after two, three stanzas. <laughs> Where are the tribes? The feathered bestiaries. Rank Aesop's animals erect and red with fur on their names to make all living things skin. He's referring to Indian culture. They looked at all Indian, all living things as their kin, relatives. Their names were like chief running deer. Black bear, old buffalo head, these are all names of the natives. In one sense, that it means that the child is wondering at the Indian culture. The Indian culture is so close to nature. They were all such natural people who believed that all living things are kin. But that culture has disappeared. You know, for the white people, they did not look at how close these men are to nature. They rather treated these men like animals. They exoticized them. They put them in the cover page of books. You know, these Indians became mere images in stories or children's literature. When the child is reading the colored frontispiece of a book, probably that is children's literature. The Indians were relegated by the whites. They were pushed by the whites into being just pictures in children's literature or just curios or museum pieces, the real struggling lives of Indians nobody cared for. The child also just wondered at it. Poor child, what could he do? Childhood that wished me Indian. In childhood, the speaker probably wished to be an Indian. He wanted to be like an Indian. Wow, red face, so close to nature, speaking from the throat. All wonder struck. The child is wonder struck by all this and wished to be an Indian. How wonderful Indian life is the child thought. Hoped that one after school I would leave the classroom chalk, the varnish smell. He wanted to leave the classroom. He wanted to leave the smell of the classroom, the chalk of the classroom. And go out into the streets like the Indian, the watered dust of the street, to join the color, clean outdoors and the Iroquois track. He wanted to be like an Indian in the streets, but the child did not know the hardships of the Indians. He wanted to be outside the classroom free, but at that time, the Indians did not even have a place to go to. Childhood, but always, as on a calendar, there stood that chief. Always the Indians were in calendars. They were the show pieces. You know, stood that chief with arms akimbo waiting. The runaway mascot paddling to his shore. You know, it is some reference to some myth. And this myth of the runaway mascot coming back to his own shore is an indication or symbol of change of fortune. 
the childhood in childhood the speaker remembered that indian standing on the calendar page as if waiting for the runaway mascot that childhood was so innocent but the adult the adult whites they just destroyed everything with what strange moccasin stealth moccasin is a kind of footwear that they have stealthily they come like indians when they fight they come with stealthy footsteps like that the scene changed the runaway mascot has come back home and everything has changed in adulthood he realizes that the innocence of childhood and its perceptions of the indians that is not the reality the french defeated the iroquois people the iroquois people became like beggars their bravery valor their culture everything disappeared with french names they were forcibly put in reservation reservation camps were like concentration camps where the indians uh, identity was crushed their names also was taken away from them they were given french names the paint was washed from their faces they were made to wear french clothes you know and they became in between lost their culture they did not get assimilated into french culture either either with french names without paint in overalls their bronze like their nobility expunged their weapons were all taken away from them you know the men they all changed beneath their elementary shawls sit like black tens their squaws while for the tourist brown pennies scattered at the old church door the ragged papooses jump and bite the dust you know they the adult men among the um, indians after the iroquois have been defeated the adult men or women sit under their elementary shawls that has been given to them in the reservation everybody is given one same colored shawl the squaws means the wives they all sit hunched like a black tent their grandeur their color their values everything gone they are all sitting hunched back covered in their shawls like a black tent while their children are all fighting over the pennies at the church door people throw some pennies at the church door and like beggars their children the indian children are fighting for the pennies and bite the dust oh it's a very sorry picture of the indians now in the reservation and what happened to their past what happened to their culture their past is sold in a shop so this is the adult speaker speaking this is the reality the child did not understand their past is sold in a shop native cultures become curios and they become the typical merchandise of the native shops beaded shoes sweet grass basket curio indian burned wood gaudy cloth inch canoes <laughs> these are all curios or trophies or scalpings for a traveler's den a traveler will buy all these things and keep it in his den it has nothing to do with the real sufferings of the indian are sometimes the indians themselves are sell selling their culture like this what has the indians come to sometimes it is true they dance <laughs> but for a bribe it is true sometimes they still dance they not only sit like black tents but they still dance but for a bribe for money after a deal done the bedraggled feather after they make a deal no we want 10 pounds 12 pounds they make a deal they bargain with the tourist and then they don don means wear the bedraggled feather again and again and again they are wearing the same old feather and it has become bedraggled and welcome a white mayor to the tribe some rich people wealthy people powerful people will come and the native indians will dance for them like fools like curios their real value their real bravery their real culture is gone completely in this reservation this reservation is a grassy ghetto remember this is a jew speaking he can feel the pain of the indians because the jews were also put in ghettos you know away from everybody else discriminated this is a grassy ghetto not a home and no home this is not this reservation is not a home for the indian it is a run down place like a beggar's den 
and these are fauna in a museum kept this is not natural these are uh, you know the plants kept in a museum and the people the indians living among these plants are also like museum pieces for being looked at by the white people you know they are like um, a spectacle the better hunters have prevailed you know the natives were the best hunters they had all the strategies and everything and they hunted for subsistence for survival <laughs> but the whites are hunting for pleasure and greed and they are hunting the natives also the whites are the better hunters look at the irony the better hunters have prevailed the whites have prevailed they have won the game losing its blood you know this is a hunting imagery but it also refers to the indians losing their culture and values tradition everything the game losing its blood now makes these grounds its script now these grounds the reservation are their graves this reservation becomes their grave they die there they lose everything they die the animals pale the shine of the fur is lost that is a hunting imagery continuing in the original times these men used to hunt animals for subsistence but now they are being hunted and are like animals in a zoo the animals pale the shine of the fur is lost bleached are their living bones they are living men the people in the reservation but they are like animals in the zoo they are like they it's like death in life existence about them you know around them watch as though through a mist why mist because there is something that separates the white people from the natives the white people can never understand the natives it is like they are looking at the natives through mist there is no real vision the whites will never understand looking at these men in in their living bones they are such pale shadows of their original glory these red indians uruqua people and looking about them as through through mist is the pious prosperous <laughs> ghost ghost because they are white and they are prosperous the men the iruqua men who were like autumn fruit mature and ripe and full of vitality they are now like living bones physically ghosts and the white people who are ghastly they are like zombies they are like cannibals i should say they are pious because the church you know remember the church door is there where they throw pennies you know the church they have the rationale of white man's burden the white people are prosperous feeding on these red indians exploiting them becoming rich because of them what a wonderful poem isn't it little bit of analysis too and we are done in the first stanza of indian reservation kanavaga the speaker hints at the deterioration of the native indian culture using rhetorical questions that begin with the word where remember where are the braves where are the tribes remember some of the cultural ingredients that have disappeared based on the rhetorical questions include the braves the monosyllabic chiefs who do not speak much those chiefs only speak in monosyllables the tribes and the esop animals esop animals and now these are animals like animals in the real world the untraceability of these critical components of the native indian culture they are such crucial components and they are untraceable now they have gone native indians at kanavaga have given up their distinctive orthodox culture and it has been destroyed by the whites which has been appropriated and destroyed by the whites i'm just feeling like typing in more besides the selling of native indian artifacts in the shops amounts to cultural appropriation native indian culture is natural and invaluable commercializing it amounts to its undervaluation and destruction the commodification of the culture means that not only do the whites exploit them but some of the native indians also trade their culture for monetary gain thus they live an inauthentic life they live an inauthentic life 
This is the situation in the Indian Reservation at Konavaga. Poem by A.M. Klein.